the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, before we begin, um, I would just like to take a moment to congratulate um, Pastor Johnson next to me, who completed his cancer treatment uh, this week and is wearing his medal, and we're just grateful that that went so well. So congratulations. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great thing to celebrate this evening. Um, Next up is uh, just our communications to the board and review of agenda by Superintendent Corden. Thank you, Madam Chair. Appreciate that. And congratulations, uh, Dr. Johnson. It's great to see you here tonight, as well as everybody else. Uh, just a couple uh, quick uh, review of the agenda. We, there have been a couple of uh, revisions to um, the consent agenda and the retirement resignation section. Uh, you'll notice those noted in red in the consent agenda. That is action item number one for us tonight. And then also, I just want to acknowledge that we've also now in the consent agenda included gifts to the district and uh, want to uh, just thank the patrons and partners across uh, our city and county who do a, a great job in supporting our kids and just want to publicly thank them as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh... All right, so let's go ahead. Uh, the chair will entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda as has been published. I'll make that motion. A second. I will, I will second that motion. Okay, all in favor of approval of the consent agenda from our February 9th meeting as currently published, say aye. aye. All right, thank you. Um, to be okay thank you sorry again with the technical difficulties this evening uh the first item in our very brief business meeting is the annual renewal or non-renewal of contracts for the 2022-2023 school year um so i'm going to turn the time over to uh director freeman to discuss and introduce that uh thank you very much uh this is our annual meeting uh, where I recommend to Superintendent Corden, who is recommending to you that the following personnel staff members have met the criteria uh, to be um, recognized for their contract renewals. Uh, in front of you, you will see that uh, we have divided these into four sections, probationary administrator contract renewals on page 23, contract administrators extensions on page 24, probationary teacher renewals on page 25 through 27, and two-year teacher extensions uh, for the 22, 23, 23, 24 school years on pages 28 and 31. Again, all these staff have met the required elements, and it is our recommendation that you take these into consideration. Thank you very much. Okay, so the chair will entertain a motion to uh, approve the renewal of these contracts as published. I'll make that motion. Thank you. And Madam Chair, I will second that motion. Okay. Any questions for Director Freeman before we take a vote? Or Superintendent Corden? He can answer them too. Uh, Mr. Freeman, just wondering if um, these are done every year then at this time? Yeah, correct. Um, I provided for you the uh, statute language uh, that talks about that. These have to be done before March 15th. This is our last board meeting before then. And it also talks about the criteria that um, is established in order to present staff. And so um, all these staff members have met those criteria. Okay, thank you. All right, all in favor of approving uh, the contract renewals as published, say aye. aye. Uh, any opposed? All right. Um, our next is item of business is um, uh, in regards to an MOU between the Oregon School Employees Association Chapter 21 and Douglas County School District 4, which is Roseburg Public Schools. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and again turn this back to Director Freeman to discuss and introduce. 
Excellent. Thank you. Um, directors, we have an opportunity that I'm very excited to bring to you. Um, because of great leadership uh, that you've heard in the last couple board meetings about our food service program uh, and the fact uh, that, well, great leadership in the fact that we are serving more reimbursable meals than we have previously, and the fact that the federal government has um, allocated more funds for a reimbursable meal, uh, we have um, generated revenue in the food service. Uh, remember that that revenue can only be spent in the food service area. And so I, along with um, Cheryl, who is in charge of the food service, um, we are recommending that we use this um, revenue that we've generated to raise the food service rate of pay by $1 per hour in all cells. And this accomplishes um, several things. It brings us up to, you know, closer. Um, we close that gap within our own salary structure among other groups. And uh, we are more competitive now with public and private entities. So uh, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Cheryl so she can give her um, vote of confidence for this also. Well, Robert, I think you've pretty much uh, outlined everything that I would have had to say. Uh, nutrition services funds can only be used for uh, nutrition services. There was a time several years ago that the nutrition services fund was not operating in the black and we actually reduced hours of our food service staff. So it makes a lot of sense now that we are running in the black that we go ahead and return and restore some of that that was taken away. I'm confident that uh, the food service fund will be able to uh, accommodate this increase in the future. Okay, thank you. Before we take questions, let's go ahead and entertain a motion uh, to move forward with this and then we can discuss. So uh, all in favor of approving the memorandum of understanding to, uh, Oh. Want the oh, I need the motion. Sorry. <laughs> Told you. I'd make the motion. I, all in favor. Thank you. I have a motion. I have a second. Thank you, Director Cotton and Director Bishop. Okay. Let's discuss before we vote. Director Krimitz, did you have a question? Yeah. I just wanted to, um, is when you said it could only be used for food services, does that mean strictly personnel or is it actual uh, commodity, food commodities, or what, where, where's the increase? So this particular increase is a request for salary increases, right. but the nutrition services fund expenditures includes our, our expenditures for food, um, our food service management company, Sedexo, and for our employees, which is, um, all of our cooks in the kitchen. So we have a nutrition services secretary, pretty much everybody but Kyle. <laughs> so that's what constitutes and the, the freezers that were discussed at a previous meeting. All those are true nutrition services expenditures. Okay, thank you. I have a couple questions. Brian. Maybe I, I, I can't find it, it's in right in front of me, but when does this take effect? Is it retro? Yeah, that's a great question, Director Cotton. Um, as presented, uh, if it's passed tonight, it will go back to the January cutoff. So um, we'll be able to implement it tonight for the February paycheck, um, but it goes back to January 19th. Second question, uh, what's the impact on, has, have you, I'm sure Cheryl figured out what the impact is gonna be for the first year. For an entire year, the additional cost will be approximately 67,000. For this year, of course, it's going to be less than half of that because it's only for approximately half the year. So I wanna say, um, I'm really happy we can do this. Um, really, really happy. Um, it's really hard to get staff and to keep staff. I know that uh, having kind of been in the food service for a long time and, um, I think this is this is this is good. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, on your appendix A here, the, is this with the dollar uh, increase already included? Or that is before? correct. Is with yes. it included? Yes. And then, can you explain to me how you get to step one, step two, three, four? What is the 
differentiation there? I can't. It's rather complicated. Our salary schedule is um, a bit unique in Roseburg. Uh, steps one through four are just that. They are salary steps uh, that a person, um, I have the ability through the CBA to place somebody new into our organization on steps one through three, depending on the uh, level of experience that a, a person comes to us. Uh, and then depending on where they're placed, January, I'm sorry, July 1st, they'll move up a step. Once they get to step four, uh, steps five and step six are longevity steps. So a person would need to be in our district for at least five years to move up to step five and at least 10 years to move up to step six. All right, any other questions? I did jokingly ask how much uh, being a mother of five children, how much experience that gave me if I were applying to work there. Um, yeah. I was like, how many steps do I get? <laughs> um, all right, so any other further questions? One more. Um, with the cost of food uh, going up so much as well, is that, are we making sure that that's going to be covered too within the, the money that's been granted to us um, along with the, I'm all for raising their salaries because that, I agree that's, it's a worthy job to, and it's hard to fill. Um, but just wanted to make sure we're also covering that a lot, you know, allowing for the food increases. We have, uh, we've made those calculations for uh, next budget year. Our food service costs will go up and it's tied to the consumer price index. That's our agreement with Sodexo. And we have taken that into account in the calculations. Thank you. Okay, now. I will entertain a motion to approve the memorandum of understanding between Oregon School District Employees Association Chapter 21 and Douglas County School District Number 4. All in favor, say aye. Okay. Excellent. All right, we will now have a brief recess if anyone needs one, and we will be reconvening uh, in work session. We need a break. Okay. We will now convene our board work session. Uh, we Tonight's uh, discussion is going to center on Phoenix Charter School and um, the update on the measures that we asked them to kind of be accountable for and their ODE report card data. So we'll turn the time over to them. Good evening. Is the presentation um, going to be broadcast on the Zoom or? Does everybody just have their copy? We we'll all have a, we all have copies. Okay. Well, then we'll just uh, announce what slide we're on as we go through. So good evening. Glad to be here again for our quarterly chance to spend some time with you all. This month, uh, as Chair Larson has pointed out, is especially focused on last school year's performance and how it aligns to the current charter contract and monitoring the academic objectives of the charter school. Moving on to the next slide for an outline of the review. Uh, we will be exploring available data related to the shared goals for the school. At the end, we do have an additional slide of data focused on other information found on the school's annual report card prepared by the Oregon Department of Education. For the current charter contract, our shared team focused on the key performance indicators of attendance, high school success, and increased ability of students to perform in English language arts and mathematics. On the next slide, you'll see that we also have in the 2020-2025 contract a comparable schools legal construct that helps provide greater context for the type of program, community size, and student type that is found at Phoenix. Uh, the schools are located throughout the state, and more than half were, of, were comparable schools utilized in the prior charter contract agreement. Moving on to the next slide. For the 2020-21 school year, uh, important notes for context here, some reminders of last school year's milestones. 
We began with students learning remotely, uh, transitioned to part-time instruction in the building starting in late January 21. About one third to a half of our students chose to remain online for the entire school year. This practice was allowable according to ODE and Rosa Public Schools operation guidelines. Phoenix did have staff available to directly meet with students at their homes and did furnish technology for students in need of means for connection. At the bottom, you can see some general numbers for context of the student body size, connection to the school and high school success outcomes, including graduation. Yeah, and that data is pulled from the Synergy database. Moving on to the next slide, um, you'll see that we get into the contract language here and wanted to just showcase that and make sure all the board members were rare, excuse me, aware of the language found in the contract. Um, and let's start the review. So you can see that uh, the school's ability uh, to perform its standard has a gradient from far exceeds all the way down to far below standard. Uh, for standard A, the benchmark of 90% attendance was selected as the me measurement for attendance because that is the benchmark readily available uh, in ODE data that's furnished to the report card. Uh, you can see the school must increase the number of students attending at the ODE benchmark by 1% to 3% or exceed the median rate of the comparable schools every year to meet the contract standard. Moving on to the next slide. The charter only had 14 of 185 students tracked by ODE to meet the benchmark of attending 90% of classes available either virtually or in the building. This is more than a 15% drop than the last school year prior to COVID-19. There is no data to compare the school year under review with the prior year since ODE did not publish data given the sudden shift to comprehensive distance learning in March of 2020. Moving on to the next slide, we can see the data in relation to the comparable schools, and you can see there's mixed results, with two schools also showing a 15% or more decrease in attendance data. Three of the schools seem to perform well with their hybrid or virtual options, attracting positive data outcomes for attendance. For reference, you can see we pulled up from a fairly reliable source an estimation of the school population size to help shine more light on the nature of the comparable schools. For performance standard A for the school year 2021, in conclusion, we were unable to assign a measure of standard performance given there's no data available for comparison. That said, there is obvious need for the attendance efforts for students to improve within the charter. We anticipate a drastic correction in this data given the return to the building and our student bodies understood limitations with performing well in the virtual approach. Our students seek a brick and mortar option with their school choice as opposed to the wide array of virtual charters available. Moving on to goal two, you can see we will start with performance standard B, which is also coupled with performance standard C, in that they both gauge high school success rates. Both contract standards only use data from the completer category of data from ODE. We will be viewing later the well-known and widely shared grad rate, which only looks at standard diploma outcomes. Completer rate looks at modified and GED outcomes as well. To meet the standard for performance standard B, the school is required to increase five or per more percentage points annually or exceed the median rate of comparable schools by the same increase of five percentage points to be considered at meeting standard. On the next slide, standard B first looks at the four-year cohort, which is not weighing their time with Phoenix, but the four years from the first year a student was enrolled in a high school. You can see there is a strong trend line from the baseline data year of the contract, but there was a decrease from the previous year where students were finishing the year with comprehensive distance learning guidelines. It is notable that ODE tracks 23 of the non-completing students continued their education with Phoenix in the 21 to 22 school year. Moving on to the comparable uh, schools slide for goal two. Uh, the median data of the comparable schools is a downward trend. Students who struggle with school engagement have had some rough years across the state. It is noteworthy to look at the cohort sizes of the four-year completers, and Phoenix has one of the larger cohorts in the comparable group. Reminder that if a student drops out from Phoenix in prior years, they remain in our cohort data. On to the next slide. The rating as per the contract standards is Phoenix Charter falls far below standard for four-year cohort completer rate 
given the rate fell more than five percentage points. It is noteworthy that the 20 to 21 rating is also the same as the average of the last three years of data at 34.13%. Moving on to the next slide, continuing goal two is performance standard C, which is similar to the prior standard, but now looking at the five-year completer data. The standard does have a different gradient schedule with a need to increase by one to three points annually to meet the standard, while standard B required a 5% increase annually to meet the standard. When accounting for fifth year students, the mission of the school starts to be greater seen with the number of successful students increasing. The cohort data shows us more of the story of the Phoenix school population with considerable amounts of the students being designated as economically disadvantaged and almost a quarter of them being classified as homeless. On to the next slide, which goes into the comparable schools. With the comparable five-year data, we again see the type of students served across the state being able to cross the high school success, excuse me, high school success finish line more readily with the additional year. On to the next slide for the performance standard C. Phoenix follows the trend line across the comparable schools and increases the rate of success to be graded by the contract standards to far exceeds standard. On to the next slide into goal three, the performance standards rely on an interim assessment tool to be administered to students twice a year, once in the fall of the school year and again the spring of the school year. That data is then distilled to show if the percentage of students who have increased in skill sets to meet standard 50% or more of the students need to demonstrate growth in English language arts. In the fall of 2020, the team at Phoenix was able to administer the STAR 360 test remotely to students. Students were then administered the test again in spring of 2021, either in the building or remotely, dependent on their education path chosen. In the end, 44 students were able to perform the test in both spring and fall. 41% of those tested demonstrated grade level growth. The performance standard D does not meet the standard. Moving on to performance standard E, in, which is the final academic standard in the contract and is similar to the last measure in approach and structure. But this time the approach, uh, excuse me, the standard approaches the academic growth of students' math abilities. Again, of the 44 students who tested in both fall and spring to provide the sample, we did not see the test scores showcase academic growth at a rate which has the school meeting the standard. Moving on to the next slide, finally here we have data that is shared in the community via the ODE school report card. The four-year grad rate is about five points lower than the completer rate, and the freshman on track rate plummeted during the early part of the pandemic. We expect it to grow again as we remain in a much stronger relationship with our students as they have returned to our campus. And then with the last slide, we um, are sharing just looking ahead and how we will be continuing to continue, uh, maintain our relationship with the board. Um, we have uh, annual school improvement planning and we're happy to share those documents as necessary. Also, we should be returning to the board again soon to, um, we are getting uh, bids on our HVAC upgrade and utilizing the emergency dollars from the Congress which are uh, managed in part by the district. Um, also, we are begun planning for our summer 2022 options and are working with the leadership team at the district on those. Uh, and again, uh, just a reminder that we do make quarterly appointments with you all and we will be back in spring, spring 2022, so either late May or early June. Um, and then, of course, we want to remain in contact with the district about our enrollment and onboarding process for 22-23. And that is the end of our presentation this evening. And I believe now we uh, switch gears to a question and answer session. Thank you for uh, coming in. I have so much to say. All right, number one, the report that was given uh, was later than requested. Number two, I really, don't care about the comparable schools data. Number three, um, 
we at RPS have uh, a higher percentage of poverty, homeless, and students requiring special education than the Phoenix. Number three, um, you have no high acuity needs classes. Number four, one of my favorite uh, people I follow online says, it's not about people, it's about the system. The problem is the numbers that your system are producing are terrible. Uh, number five, we have to count our kids who have intellectual disabilities and you don't. Therefore, our graduation rate was 89%, yours was 34%. Number next, hey, next number, it's, uh, it's about the kids, not about your process. Unfortunately, your process is failing your students. Next, what are you going to do? What you're doing isn't working. You say you're doing great things, but your results show they are in fact terrible. Next, I need to know you're going to do what you're going to do to improve uh, the terrible and substandard outcomes. Next, I have had several teachers at RPS say they're embarrassed to be associated with a school that has this data. Next, you are not currently keeping your end of the contract. And unfortunately, I view you, your school and system as a liability to the students enrolled at Phoenix. So I need to know what you're gonna do to improve your terrible outcomes. Well, thank you, Director Bishop. That is uh, quite a list there. Um, I believe I captured it. Um, I'm getting a sense from you that your, our data troubles you. Um, I won't lie that our data right now troubles us as well. Um, we take the education of all of our students very importantly. And I, I'm, I'm, I really apologize that this was just quite a lot of information to so suddenly take in here. Um, do you have a recommendation where I should start in the list of information you have provided me? Um, I, I understand your sentiment. I think it all comes down to one question. What are you gonna do to improve your outcomes? Because I'm, I'm very frustrated. We talked about this last year and nothing's changed. Your four-year graduation rate is 29%. I just looked it up online. That is so far below the standard. We have uh, homeless people in our, in Roseburg Public Schools. We have people that need high acuity. We have people that are, uh, have, require special education. We have the same students, um, but you're so far below the standard. It, it's discouraging in every single way. I need to know what you're gonna do to improve this situation. Thank you. That does help provide clarification and understanding on my part. Um, right now, what we're doing is we are engaged in our uh, school improvement process. We are focused on um, making sure there's strong relationships with all the students through our um, stabilizing the school community. We are engaged in activities such as uh, making sure that we're serving all of our students equitably and in a, a welcoming environment. Um, this year has been marked with hate speech and other trends, and we are focused on making sure that our trauma-informed systems and our responses to making sure that we have a safe school environment is met. So that is the first place I want to start with safety. Second, we are working with all of our teachers to make sure that they are in a coaching system. We are in an accreditation year, and so we will be opening our doors to an outside team of educators who will be taking a deep dive and in informing us how our education approaches are meeting standards of accreditation from the international body known as Cognia. Um, we are continuing to make sure we have innovative approaches in the classrooms for instructions. Um, all of our educators on our team have attained a project-based learning credential and we are implementing project-based learning approaches in instruction. This is to further garner engagement with the student in their learning and to make sure that they are gaining skill sets that are community centered and that they are prepared to join the workforce. Um, lastly, we are continuing as the key performance measures with this new contract have helped guide us in our relationship with the board, making sure that we have systems that are informing our team on an ongoing manner 
from the lead caseworker, which we call the homeroom teacher, which is called the pathways teacher, make sure that they are ongoingly informed about student attendance, ongoingly informed about abilities with via the STAR 360 uh, interim assessments, and have an understanding of students in their abilities in English language arts and mathematics. We are, um, as the contract agreement um, put us in a new orientation with our special education services. We are um, have a special education licensed staff on board, uh, an English language arts teacher, a math teacher, and we are building systems that are uh, resident here at the school to make sure that IEP meetings and all of the things that come with that are done well, and not only done well, are done in a way that is building relationships with the household that engages the household further in the student's education and meeting their IEP goals. Um, I think I will stop there. Um, but again, we will be going through school improvement planning processes and we're happy to share those um, documents with you. And again, we are uh, having an accreditation year. So we will have uh, an external team coming into the school community and assessing us through those standards. And we are also in the last months of our sanctuary model uh, accreditation and making sure that we are making sure we have a safe community that welcomes students and brings um, a trauma informed process that allows the student to be stable and to be learning in the classroom. Um, and I am hearing you loud and clear about the data that the district has. And I'm hearing you loud and clear that you um, share some uh, 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 strong feelings about comparable schools mechanisms, but that is the contractually agreed mechanism. And I, I would encourage you to um, research about those schools and how knowing about those schools uh, showcases how we um, we are in, in line in some regards with the type of population we serve. Um, and I'm just gonna, I'm gonna leave it on that thought. Um, Thomas, Mike, I have a question. It, your data is based on 185 students, but you only had 44 students that you were able to test to even get these results which that's really concerning to me that you're only tracking the progress consistently of, you know, that's, I mean, where were the other kids? I guess is my question. If you have 185 kids enrolled and you only have 44 that you were able to test in the fall and again in the spring, how do we know where the rest of those kids are sitting? I think that's a very good question. I shared the same concerns when this data was shared with me, um, but I wanted to make sure that we were following the contract as written. There was yeah, data collected. There are 141 students unaccounted for. We have no clue how they're doing there. I, I, I understand that in this context, we do not have them demonstrated here. The contract mandates the interim test results are what is guiding the data report. There was uh, tests done in the fall of some students, but then they weren't able to be achieved in the spring, or there was students achieved by a test achieved by students in the spring and not the fall. So we only brought forth data where we had a reliable set of data that included what was directed by the contract. I would remind everyone that this was uh, a point in our recent history, fall of 2020, where we were disconnected from the school community. We were, we were in a mode that was solely remote. And I do recognize that this is a poor data set to then represent the entire school community. I was the one who also helped lead the discussions at the negotiation table that using the standardized testing only looks at our eighth grade and our juniors. And I wanted all students to be tested. And so, what I've learned, though, is that we have a very good percentage, and I'll, I'll turn it over to Brandy to answer here, a very good percentage of students that were tested this year, now back in the building, now back in our brick and mortar traditional setting, where we're able to make sure we're meeting the needs of the students. 
Yeah, what, what was your percentage of fall tests? How many of your kids out of your total population took the fall assessment? So the fall assessment uh, in STAR 360 alone, we have tested about 60%, but we've also used MobiMax to test our students specifically in math and we're at about 85% of them tested in math. And so we are using multiple assessments and we will also um, test them again in the spring. And so we do, um, we do have and will have better data in um, at the end of this year than we have from last year. Okay. Any other concerns, Director Cotton? I have a, a question. Have you guys missed any days of school this year? Have you been open every day? We've like been open days? every day. Yes. Okay. Good. Um. So we can only comment on what's in this report, correct? I mean, that's the, we got this report on Friday, Friday afternoon. And it's, it's, it's very disappointing to me, but I, we only have the report to go by. Make sense? We, I mean, going through this report, it's, 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 it's a very big disappointment to me. We were asked to provide the data. We were asked to provide the data, no matter the color of the data in meetings with leadership, including Chair Larson, and we have done as directed. And that, that's fine, I'm, but I'm just telling you, it's disappointing to me. Hopefully the next quarter will be better. Thomas, I just, I, I want you to understand that the evidence that was presented to us shows no, true evidence of teaching and learning, and that's frustrating, okay? If this was a, a Roseburg public school that had the same data, there would be a lot of administration change. There'd be a lot of turnover. Um, this, is, this is terrible. This is worse than abysmal. This is the worst I've ever seen. And I need you to understand that. We'd need better and more from you. This is uh, a question that I had with the testing. What can you do to make sure, because to us, that's the assessment that we're looking for. And if they're not being tested thoroughly or well enough, we can't get a good take on, on those kids, how well they are progressing. So what can, what can you do or do you, can you see yourself doing to um, have those kids tested in the spring that where we're getting 80% of them at least tested? Or you know, what prohibits them from getting tested? I think if there's, please, please continue. Well, it, I mean, as long as they are showing up, um, if they're there, I'd get a test in there then, you know, or somehow make sure that they get that test completed. So you have something, not just us, but you have something to go by. We fully agree with you. Um, we are testing students as they occur on campus. Um, we have not been testing because it's winter now and the the contract is to look at the start and the end of the school year um, and we will begin testing in mid-april and want to achieve uh, a good percentage of all the students and i completely concur that when in doubt test early and get it done so we have accurate data to understand the student population in the school community at the same time, the data also showcases a highly transitional population that has low connectivity with school in general. Um, I will also remind you all that this is a population that we are working to re-engage. Our goal is to have an open door to catch students and bring them into high school success that probably wouldn't find high school success until later in life. And so that is our stated mission, and we've never changed who we are. And I, I understand that there's a belief that we don't fit as a Roseburg school and mode of teaching and learning, but our mandate from you and the community is to follow our special purpose, our special mission, 
and to serve the at-risk of school failure youth. And we are continuing to serve that mission and bring those youth in the door. And yeah. those youth obviously don't bring good data sets with them. They don't bring good data sets with them, especially in a pandemic. And I'm not trying to make excuses. I don't ever wanna stand before you all with excuses. I wanna stand before you all with plans and, and, and tangible places to move next. And I, I'm bringing in outside resources to improve the school community. And so I feel we're doing what we should be doing. We are stabilizing this school community in numerous levels. We are stabilizing this school community while also seeking out best practices and continuous improvement. Um, if there are other tangible suggestions to help us in our leadership, I'm all ears. Um, Brandy, do you have any other thoughts? I don't. Um, when you have the um, accreditation uh, group coming in to, I would think that they would be able to help you um, immensely to uh, have that, have that um, give you ideas to how you can improve because um, without some real plans to try to improve, I think we probably will get the same results. Uh, and I understand your community that you work with is difficult and, and that you are doing, um, a, you know, the best, I guess, that you can, but we're just hoping for better too. So just understand our point. Oh, I, I agree. And the last two accreditation processes have provided us, and these are done like every seven years, have provided us improvement requirements, and they've also provided evidence of commendations and powerful practices. And so I, I, I do see your vantage on the, the data as stated by Director Bishop. Another vantage of the data is given the comparable school mechanism, you're seeing a, tool, a team that is able to perform at the level of what the, this, to perform with the school community. And that's not an excuse. That's, I feel that there's a viewpoint that we are not experts in working with the school community, but the fact that we are walking in line with the other comparable schools is an indicator of that we are experts in working with this population. We are getting results with this population. Um, I, I, and I, I just, I, I feel like there needs to be more learning about the school community and that's something I need to work on because the, the viewpoints shared with us tonight are not ones that I take lightly. And we need to do more work to help illuminate for you our process, our approaches, and honestly, more importantly, our student population because it is a different equation in many regards. Thomas, I feel like you're blaming the student and that, that bothers no. me on an ethical level. No, I am not. I am, I'm more showcasing for you what we are working with and the growth we're achieving with them. And again, looking at the fifth year data, that that is higher than the fourth year data. We bring in students that have no skill sets, that have second and third grade leading, reading level ability and under standards of excellence, yes, they are not excellent, but under standards of re-engagement, we are re-engaging them. We are building skill sets with them around our mission, which is caring productive citizens. And we are building commitments with those students to thrive and be a part of the school community and gain high school success and ultimately gain a success story in the community. I'm not blaming the student. What I'm trying to help explain is that there is a way of looking at this school population to see the growth rates and some of these categories in this data. Yes, we should see growth rates and we, we will work and we will march with you with these key performance indicators to create growth as agreed upon in the contract. And so that is more what I'm focused on. I'm never trying to, to 
chide the board with that it's our students fault that that is not anything i'm trying to do here and i i i, I would urge uh, director bishop you and i maybe have a follow-up discussion and i would love to engage in some shared learning with you and and help you see where i'm at and more importantly gain your insight for where we're missing the mark in your esteem besides these big data pictures and and, and i'll stop there yeah i think i think thomas i think i think it's hard because we know we know the work that you're doing but it is still hard to look at a graduation rate of 34 percent saying you're really achieving success with these students or even 47 percent i mean if roseburg high school had a 47 percent graduation rate i mean so I appreciate the challenge, um, but I feel like these kids deserve better. That's that that's kind of how I'm feeling right now. So I, I'm glad that you're going to look at systems. Any other final comments from any director, Director Lee? I'm I'm just I'm looking at the four-year cohort completer and the five-year cohort completer charts and. I'm, I guess I'm asking, <clears throat> is the 2018-2019 four-year cohort completer included in the population of the 2019-2020 five-year cohort completer? Because um, it, it looks like a certain percentage of kids finished in the fifth year who had not finished in the fourth year of the year before. Is that how that works? Yes. Okay. So, and that explains to me why the numbers go up and down. It's, we're, we're following different, okay, thank you. That's, that's useful to me. All right, anything else, Reverend? I um, will speak very carefully. Uh, I've been in Roseburg since 1989. The Phoenix performance level in the early 2000s was measurably higher than it is now. Something has changed and I don't know what. Number two, you spoke about safety for the students. I am personally aware of one family in particular that don't feel safe at all on your campus. Any any other final thoughts from any of the directors? Thank you. Um, you said you had some policies and uh, some initiatives set up to try and increase these uh, these stem these measures and everything. And I hope that's true. I just want to know: Are those things that you're not doing already? Uh, are they the same things that you have been doing to try and increase your numbers for the past six months? And, and I'm new to this, so I'm jumping in here, but. Are they new initiatives? Are they new things? Or are you just continuing doing the same thing that you have been doing? Um, some of the, the programs and, and initiatives are um, on, on the early stages. One of the things that we implemented is project-based learning, and it just started uh, in the fall. And so we are continuing with that. Um, you know, teachers and instructors were trained last year, and so they're implementing it this year. We're working on engagement levels with students. Um, sanctuary, we're in the third or fourth year of sanctuary, um, but we have had, you know, staff turnover. So we have, you know, new people being trained in sanctuary. There's a lot of different things that we are focusing on. We have had mental health in the building in the past, but because of the pandemic that obviously got shut down. So we are now having to bring mental health therapists back into the building. So some of it is new. Some of it had to be paused. And so we're now having to bring some of it back in. Um, special education services in the building is new. We're adding new staff to that team. So some of it is new, some of it is not. Okay, and one more thing, what, what would you guys consider to be a successful turnout for students that you're gonna be testing in April? Um, you, we've been talking about how many of your total students. So what would you consider to be a successful testing rate for this next upcoming test? 80%, 70%, what, what's, what's realistic? Our, our goal is to test at least 90% of our students.
Okay, we'll be interested to see that result. That'll be great. All right, anything else? All right, um, at this point, we are uh, going to adjourn and uh, we will be going into executive session. So those of you who are in Zoom uh, will be placed in a waiting room uh, while we are in executive session. And then we will be reconvening regular session uh, for a brief statement at the end. Thank you. <laughs> and at this point, we are adjourning both our regular meeting and executive session for this evening. Our next meeting is March 16th. Thank you.